everybody. So here we are in a broiling summer day. Um, there's a few things coming up that we just want to have everyone be aware of. And um, there's the annual um, Midwest Renewable Energy Fair in Custer, Wisconsin, which is considered probably the top renewable energy fair in the country. It's an incredible, uh, incredible experience. Lots of fun, and it's a three-day uh, three event from June 23rd through 26th. Look it up under Energy Fair on the web, get the schedule. There's great music at night. There's all hundreds of exhibits and um, vendors during the day. Uh, electric cars have been around there for years on display, solar cars, actually. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a great event camping available also. So the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair in Custer, June 23rd to 26th. And then on that same weekend, June 25th, is the big event up in Ashland. Um, the, uh, the water uh, gathering uh, with the Communities United by Water event. And I know there's uh, some of our people are planning to drive up. I think Jan and Greg are thinking of going, aren't you? Yeah, we're thinking about it. We'll, we'll have to see if we can make that work. Mm -hmm. Ashland's way at the top of the state, so it's a long drive, but it's beautiful up there. Mm -hmm. And this is being uh, coordinated by uh, the Native American communities. And then on, uh, back here in Milwaukee, on Juneteenth Day, Sunday, June 19th, is one of the biggest Juneteenth events in the whole country. Um, it uh, starts earlier in the morning with a parade, but the event itself is 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. between Center Street and Burleigh. So there's a lot of us that don't want to miss going to Juneteenth Day. And then on uh, our regular Friday, um, Friday uh, demonstrations in front of Chase Bank is going to return to the downtown main Chase Bank again, because the construction there is pretty well over with and it's clear and so we can uh, more easily um, return there and have our demonstrations. Plus, the weather's better, and we don't have the howling winter winds coming in off of Lake Michigan like we do in the winter months. So um, we'll be meeting there at 12 noon. But we've also joined, we uh, had agreed uh, with our steering committee, and we'd agreed with the with, um, uh, Milwaukee um, and the Wars Coalition, which we're actually a member of, to join forces with the and the Wars Coalition to picket at our Congress People's offices downtown at 11 o'clock on Friday mornings. Every other week, they're going to be doing that. And so in a, this week at 11 o'clock, we're going to be picketing in front of Gwen Moore's office. Um, and then at 12, we'll just walk one block up to Water in Wisconsin, which is only one block away, and do our Chase Bank thing. And they'll be joining us um, with some we'll of a larger crowd at the Chase Bank too. And we've this is part of our ongoing uh, coalition work uh, and and supportive work with Peace Action Wisconsin and the other peace community here, and making the links between militarism and climate change, which is a a real strong um, component of ours in our work. So the demands will be to ask our Congress people to vote. To re vote to reduce military spending and fund climate solutions. And secondly, to join the Democratic Party Council on Environment and Climate Crisis to make sure that when Moore and Senator Tammy Baldwin are part of that, that uh, Council on Environment and Climate. So this, uh, this week it'll be at Gwen Moore's office. 11 o'clock, and that's at 2.50, I believe, 2.50 uh, was Wisconsin Avenue. It's um, just one block east of water in Wisconsin. And then there's one other item that I just have to share with you because it just struck me as being so terrific. 3.50 nationally came out with this proposal and a, um, actually a, a national petition campaign 
to have climate disasters named after the fossil fuel companies that caused those climate disasters. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine uh, the news that would say, um, uh, Hurricane Exxon Mobil is heading towards Florida tonight, should hit by midnight, or uh, Hurricane Shell uh, is, uh, is heading towards Mexico. And uh, those will be a, a wake up call if we could only get that passed through. So it'd be, it's a fun campaign to be a part of, to see if we can have a little reality check on these terrible hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and wildfires. So that's it for the 350 Milwaukee News. There we go. Greg, you want to take it? I think Terry's got a question or a comment. Quick okay, quick. Terry. I have another announcement, and that is that today, um, as our representative to the Coalition for More Responsible Transportation, I went to the um, first session put on by Wisconsin DOT um, about um, a, a, the big, a big show, actually, about ex explaining their, their plans for the expansion of I-94 mm -hmm. through, through the city. And, um, and fortunately, they had tables where you could sit down and write comments. And I wrote a bunch of comments. Um, they have another such session tomorrow. And that's going to be at Marquette High School. Mm. Um, so if anybody can make it to that session, I would encourage you to. It's from 4 to 7 p.m. Thank you, Terry. That's really an issue. There's, a, there's petitions out there online, too, to sign on that issue. And uh, Jim has something to say here. Well, I was going to say, that's a great idea to name the hurricanes or earthquakes or whatever after these companies, but we're going to run out of names real fast. There's not that many companies. I think we need to append each of the different board members' names in order so we go through all the executives of those companies as we name them off. Exxon, CEO, whatever, and so on. Give us at least a few more incidents per year because we know there's going to be more coming. You're right. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. And uh, so let's uh, let's kick off the main part of the meeting here. Uh, this began to be originated a couple months ago, and with uh, a couple of things happening. One is that uh, 350 Madison changed their name to uh, 350 Wisconsin, and uh, in addition to that, about a month or maybe six weeks ago. Uh, we be, were invited to join a group uh, planning a uh, protest in Chicago, and uh, Emily Park was pretty much heading that up, and she um, invited us as well as, um, well, maybe I shouldn't say that, I, I don't know between her and Larry, but mm -hmm. um, she invited us as well as um, 350 Chicago, and um, so we're kind of starting to do things a little bit together. So uh, in discussions, we thought maybe it would be a good idea to, to get everybody together and uh, and talk a little bit. I wanna, you know, we got people coming in. I wanna <clears throat> do a real brief introduction. When I was looking at everybody's uh, bios, I realized that I could speak for 10 minutes just introducing them. So this is going to be very brief. I had to decide which order to uh, introduce people in. And I decided to do it geographically in terms of distance from Milwaukee rather than alphabetically. Um, so first of all, you've heard uh, Julie. Julie's on our uh, steering committee. Uh, I'm also a member of the steering committee along with many of the other people that are on, on this call. Um, but We'll get back to 350 Milwaukee in a bit. So go out from here and uh, to Madison. Uh, Emily Park, though, is here from uh, 350 Wisconsin. And she is uh, the fossil-free fed campaign organizer. 
and uh, find out more about that uh, later in the meeting. And she splits her time uh, between 350 Wisconsin and 350 US. So um, she's got a couple of different perspectives that she'll be bringing. Uh, going out in distance, uh, 350 Chicago is the next closest uh, to Milwaukee. Uh, Larry Koble is here, he's a board member and uh, we'll find out a little bit more about how they're organized. And he's been with 350 Chicago, he says from nearly the beginning. And uh, that would bring us to Melissa Bryce, who's listed as a core volunteer. Find out how that works in a little bit. Uh, she founded the local 350 chapter, that is the Chicago local chapter in May of 2013. She said that was after attending the largest climate protest in the U.S. to date, which was in February of uh, 2013. And furthest from Milwaukee is 350 Minnesota. Teresa, and she goes by T. McClenty, was the executive director there. And she's been with 350 uh, Minnesota just uh, this year, according to the bio. And uh, she said that's a continuation of her career as a servant for all communities. Now we've set this up with about 10 minutes for each organization to uh, give us a little background about uh, how they're organized and, and some about what they're doing. So we'll do the geographic in reverse order. And so we'll start with T. I was hoping that I was not the one to go first since this is my first meeting with you all, but that's always my luck, you know, that's why. <laughs> so hello everyone, this is my first meeting. Um, I'm T. McClenty and um, I've been with MN350, sorry. I've been with MN350, I just started in February. Um, I came from um, doing some community work uh, leading some grant work and uh, providing resources um, in BIPOC communities. And prior to that, I have a labor background. So just in a nursing background as well. So lots of intersection that brings me to this climate work. And I got into uh, the climate work because I wanted to see more BIPOC communities involved in the climate movement and to just raise up the voices of low income and BIPOC communities. So I'm excited to be here. I've been excited to be part of the MN350 team. It's an amazing team that we are doing at, uh, in Minnesota. Um, when I think about climate, we are working on quite a few things. So I'll just kind of kick off our last recent action alert that talks about some of the work. And we have, because it's nice outside, we can get outside now. So um, our transit team is working with some um, um, high school uh, interns who wanted to get into the climate movement. So they are doing um, electric bus vehicles, working with their school districts to um, engage them and taking a pilot program and trying to get a, a, a waiver to pay for electric vehicles and talking to their elected, elected officials as well about um, really moving the electric vehicles to save the environment. And so they started this month and pretty excited to have a diverse team of students working with our um, senior organizer, Maddie, who's been doing a great job with our electric school buses and trying to work with our elected officials as well to um, pass a MOU um, to support um, electric bus vehicles. We also, for our Green New Deal, the subcategory of the Green New Deal is our People's Climate and Equity Program Plan that ULA has been leading that, that work. Um, that's how I found out about MN350 is through the Green New Deal. And so they are now moving into house parties and talking to people about green jobs um, and how that's healthy for the environment. And um, this morning they did a collaborative uh, meeting with um, their partners to talk about the environment. They did a great job with that. Um, you know about our work in line three, and now we are working in collaboration with Wisconsin um, for our line five. And so we are excited to work with you guys and um, just trying to figure out how we can, lessons learned from line three and um, how we can bring that into line five. 
we will be going to Ashland. Um, I'll be attending Ashland as well. So um, that's going to be a beautiful four hour drive. I think it is for me to go there, but I hear it's just beautiful there. Um, the other thing, our policy action team is starting to uh, volunteer. Of course, you know, we are getting ready to go into the primaries. And so we are uh, working with um, sending out um, forms for those who would like to have us endorse them and um, working pretty well with the policy action team. Um, Noel has the lead network. Several of us, including myself, were delegates to the state. So we went to the DFL convention and really try to move the resolutions that are climate friendly. Um, the other piece that we're working on is, I already talked about our house parties, the Treaty, the treaty People's Walk um, in Line 5, that's happening June 11th through the 25th. So beginning on the morning of June 11th, the indigenous leaders and guests will walk over 100 miles in prayer along the South Shore. So we are part of that and um, looks like that's how we're gonna end up in Ashland, Wisconsin. So hoping to get more people to join that. We have our front line um, fund that we are moving at MN350, trying to um, do some fundraising to get our frontline fund support out there. At, at MN350, our deputy director is no longer with us. So right in my transition into MN350, um, our deputy director did an amazing job onboarding me. And now he has a great job working for the state and so um, one of the things I looked at was our organizational structure. And I know that the, our, or, um, our organizers have great support with Grant, who's been doing a great job um, working with our organizers. But I just hired an organizing director who will be starting um, the 28th of this month. So pretty excited about that. And um, that's what's happening at MN350. I'm not, I'm not sure how much in detail I'm supposed to go. So, and I tend to talk fast. So just let me know if I, if you have any questions for me. I'm just checking the chat. Are we late? Okay, that's uh, on a different uh, line. Um, yep. I noticed that uh, you'd met, you'd listed a very ambitious list of programs that you're working on. Uh, we're volunteer uh, entirely. I'm wondering how you're organized so that you can support all of those uh, initiatives. Yeah, um, MN 350 um, has a history of being volunteer led. And so we have over, I want to say 15,000 volunteers. We're now looking at our list of volunteers to find out which ones are active. But we have a large volunteer group. What we are embarking at MN 350 is um, continuing on that path of having our volunteers um, help lead with us. But we are going into a culture shift where we are becoming more community led uh, with volunteer engagement as well. And so we can't do the work without our volunteers, but we also want to be inclusive of BIPOC communities. And so our board has moved and challenged all of us to really shift our focus with still having volunteers because um, we can't do the work with just the staff that we have. Um, and so our volunteers are helping us lead that work. And we have interns as well. Our communications team, which Brett, our deputy director, was leading our communications department and no longer is there. And then one of our um, communication staff is going to go on maternity leave. So we are bringing in some part-time paid interns as well. And so that's how we kind of center our work on how much help we need, where, where we can pull the list of volunteers from. We have ads that go out, job posting, and you'd be surprised how many people want to come in and volunteer or do internship with us. So that's how we're able, the staff lead the work. I think Lisa, I don't know if she's the one from MN350, but um, we have our food systems work as well. And so she's part-time, but we have our staff who lead the work and then um, train our volunteers to be trained the trainers and then lead in some of the work to help support our staff. Okay, let's, uh, thank you. First of all, thanks very much. Uh, that is interesting. And I've got some questions to bring up in the discussion, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, um, it said in there, our challenges right now for me, I am working with funders trying to bring in money for MN350 to help support our work and to bring in some more staff 
to support some of these initiatives and, and programs that we have going on at MN350. I just had a um, nice meeting with in-person meeting with one of the staff who said, can you please hire another organizer to help me? And so we are looking at some grants to help support that because as you know, it's not sustainable to have um, staff and hire staff to come out of general operating budgets. And so trying to move staff into a um, funded grant. So working um, with a lot of funders to try to get some more funds coming in. And we have two big fundraising events that we're planning this year as well. Yeah, we're, we're also a volunteer here in Chicago. So I would also love to hear more, a little bit more about how you are funded and maybe we can uh, get some get some ideas for Chicago here. Sure. Okay, well, let's go to Chicago, Larry. So um, we're also basically all volunteer based. Um, uh, we do have a board uh, that does meet, you know, quarterly, uh, but our, the heart of our engine is basically all the volunteers that we have. We don't have any staffers. Um, we're working towards that, trying to get fundraising done. Um, we've done a lot of, you know, uh, individual fundraising events, um, but, uh, you know, we, we're looking to get foundations, but just to sort of talk about the organization in general. So, like I said, we're mainly volunteer based. Um, we've had several different campaigns uh, led by our volunteers. Um, we had our we had a victory in Chicago for our divestment campaign. Uh, Melissa was like the person who sort of drove that engine um, to help us get that done with a lot of, like I said, a lot of volunteers. Uh, we've been working on that for about seven years, uh, meeting with uh, aldermen from all over the city, uh, worked with a couple of different treasurers. Uh, one of the things that sort of benefited us was the fact that we had one of our aldermen because we do have corruption here. Uh, the person who was the <clears throat> head of the finance committee got indicted, uh, a 14 count indictment for corruption. And that meant that the person who we first met about our divestment campaign, who was in favor of it, uh, basically took over the finance chair position. Uh, and plus we had favorable elections where uh, more people who would be on our side were elected. So that helped us get there. But most importantly, it was the people who just did the work of scheduling time to go see uh, Alderman, go sit down with, with the uh, treasurer, uh, you know, endless meetings to talk to that, to the two different uh, administrations of the treasurer um, about the issue and just be persistent. That was the big thing that I take away from it is just, we worked at it and worked at it and worked at it and worked at it. And finally, we've got our breakthrough uh, on March 23rd, uh, where it passed the city council by unanimous consent. Um, and the city of Chicago divested $70 million in about 18 months. They were already, we knew we were gonna win because they were already starting the process. Um, the previous treasurer summers, uh, did about, I think, 15 million. And then this current treasurer, Conyers Urbans, uh, had, did the rest of the 70 million. Um, and uh, they, they had the big, they had the vote by unanimous acclamation and it passed. Uh, seven years of good hard work uh, by a lot of people helped get that to happen. We've also worked on other campaigns like um, the Ready for 100, which has helped get the city of Chicago to commit to uh, certain dates to be, uh, to have the city decarbonized, uh, have city buses converted over to electric. Um, and now that we're in that sort of process where we're watching or participating in different groups to work on follow on legislation uh, to make that uh, commitment and the city's climate action plan a real thing. Back in 2008, they had a climate action plan the city really didn't do anything about it. And now they've got a new one and there's a lot of groups, including ours, that are gonna try to hold their feet to the fire and say, okay, this is what you're saying you're gonna do. Let's let's make this real. Uh, we're also, Alex, who's joining us here, was our representative on the Climate uh, Equitable Jobs Act, uh, or as part of, there was a coalition called the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. 
Alex went there, advocated for decarbonization as fast as possible and clean energy. Because um, one of the, the things that we do are divestment and advocating for clean energy. That's mainly what we're, our sort of goals are as, an, as a group. Um, and so one thing that we're, our current campaign that we're working on is our state divestment campaign. Uh, Melissa, we did that. We started that, what, about a year ago, I think, just kicked that off. And then uh, we did a lot of research trying to understand uh, what who, what politicians to talk to uh, and coming up with a the language for a state bill. Um, Melissa, if you, if you want to sort of chime in and sort of be additive, since I'm starting to ramble a bit, um, and uh, I think like, especially the, the, this, you'll, you'll have a better handle it than I would. Yeah, I can quickly summarize the state campaign. So we've drafted a bill that we would like to see the um, six state pension funds and some city pension funds, as well as potential operational budgets for the city, um, immediately freeze new investments. And then within five years, um, fully divest from the top 200 fossil fuel companies. And so we have a draft legislation that we look we put together based off Maine and New York um, because Maine already passed. And I think, I can't remember if New York passed or not. I think it might have. Um, so we looked at those bills and um, created our own. And there's a local organization called the Illinois Environmental Council that they passed tons of legislation through Springfield. So they're gonna look at our bill and tell us if we should you know, uh, change it or anything like that because we're not that versed in writing legislation. Um, but we already have a chief sponsor for that. Um, Senator Laura Fine said that she would support us on that. And so we're just meeting with different legislators to see if we can garner support. And um, we're also trying to build a coalition. So really trying to weave a larger web within the state of Illinois for environmental work, um, which is a, a big undertaking. And um, so any advice on, I guess, coalition building is something we'd be interested in as well. Yeah, and I think the other thing, the uh, the last thing that we're sort of been working on starting back in last year about, I guess maybe it was this time, maybe a little bit later, uh, we started working with uh, with Emily from uh, 350 Wisconsin now, uh, it was 350 Madison on the, you know, fossil free fed work, uh, campaign work. Um, we helped organize with, uh, 350 Wisconsin and a number of groups here in the city. And we did do the fossil free fed on October 29th. Uh, it was very rainy, very cold, but still we had the third largest. Uh, I think we were the third largest uh, of all the different ones that happened at the 13 branches. Uh, so pretty proud of that. That I think if we would have had a nice day, well, who has a nice day during the end of October? It's always wet and rainy when you go trick or treating. Um, we probably would have had a bigger turnout than what we had because uh, I know I had a couple of people who called me and said, I'm not coming, it's too rainy. I was like, no. Nah. Um, so, uh, but that's a lot of the work that we are doing um, uh, as, as far as an organization. And the one thing that we do, I think one of the, you know, when Melissa and I first started talking about how we make this organization work, one of the things we always were trying to make sure that, uh, you know, we understand that people have the logistics of living to get through. Uh, a lot of our volunteers are people who have full-time jobs. Um, uh, we do have some folks who are retired, um, but a lot of the people who do the bulk of the work are people who have jobs. And so we always sort of say, we understand you gotta, you gotta go grocery shopping, you gotta do your laundry. Um, we just ask that you, do what you, you know, do what you promised you're going to do and, uh, and help out where you can. And I think that, that that's worked. I mean, we, there are other things we'd like to probably do better, especially once we get a staff or a staffer, at least one, um, to make our, us more effective. Uh, I don't know, does, uh, Melissa, is there anything else you'd like to add about how we do things? Um, just one more thing, and then um, I don't know, we might be out of time, but one thing I wanted to mention is that we do have a board of directors and they're a working board, and then we have our core group of volunteers, so there's about like 20 people that do a majority of the work, and then we have about 1,500 people on our listserv, you know, people that we call on to participate in actions or sign petitions, um, and then there'll be, of those core volunteers, probably just one person leading the campaign, so making sure that the meetings come, drive the direction, um, you just kind of like make sure it progresses 
dresses um, and then divvy up the work from there. So like I'll lead divestment, Alex doing a lot on the Chicago politics um, and then Larry's heading up the fossil free fed. Um, but yeah, so I'm also interested, I guess, in when we get to the discussion part about how to empower people to take on leadership roles and to retain people. I feel like that's something I really don't do a good job at. Like we'll have a lot of people show up and then I think they don't stick around because they haven't like really gotten plugged in. Um, so that's something I've been personally struggling with over the years. Do you have any paid staff in Chicago? No. No, okay. We're all volunteers. Great, thank you. Thank both, thanks to both of you. Uh, so can anyway. I just ask a question? So the oh, two, sorry. Melissa and I can't, I don't see your name. Larry. You two, are, you two are the only paid staff in Chicago? We have no paid staff. Oh. We're all volunteers. We just, we don't, we, we, we're, we've, we've been fundraising um, and we got a little late to that game. Um, we had a fiscal sponsor for up until I think a year and a half ago. Um, and we had them for about a year and a half. And we finally became a 501c3 somewhere, maybe it was like late 2020. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, I think that's one of the things we, we are not good at at this point is, you know, doing the whole grant process. So we're working on it, trying to get better at it. Um, we've written a grant, didn't get it, um, and we're working on identifying potential grant makers now, yeah. you know, funders, uh, and going through that process. So any help that anybody can give as far as advice, we will take it. <laughs> right behind you. Emily. All right, so because I am extra, I have slides. Um, so uh, is it possible for me to share my screen? Do I have that permission? I think you should give it a shot. All right. I hope that hope that's working. Yep. Okay. Um, so would it help Greg if I sort of started out by just giving a, a bird's eye view of how 350.org is structured in general? I don't know if that's helpful. Yes, I think so. I think that would be helpful to okay. a lot of us, actually. Yeah. So 350.org, of course, is the, I don't know, I don't like the phrase parent organization, but it was the, the, the organization founded by Bill McKibben and a bunch of students in Vermont um, in 2008 or nine, I don't remember what. And then so 350.org, just in terms of branding, I guess you could say, is, is like a parent organization. But uh, all of us as, you know, the, the four the four local groups represented here today, we are all technically legally independent of 350.org, uh, completely separate entities. Uh, so 350.org, of course, has, it's a global organization. So there are working teams around the world. There's, uh, I believe there are 350.org employees on every continent except for Antarctica, of course. Um, and then, so here in the US, um, that we are led by the US Leadership Council is what they call themselves. And then there are, of course, the most, most local groups are in the US. Um, and then within the US, there's sort of this, this loose network called the Network Council, which is made up of the 10 largest 350.org local groups. So um, I believe Minnesota 350 and Colorado, 350 Colorado, those might be the two largest local groups in the US. Um, so if it sounds like they are very well resourced, it's because they are the largest. <laughs> they have more staff than I think any of the others do. But then there's also uh, 350 New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts, Bay Area, Portland, uh, Seattle. I'm sure I'm missing some other people in there. And then 350 Wisconsin rounds out the, uh, the top 10, I guess. It's really the top nine plus us. We are a distant number 10. Um, so that's sort of a, an idea of how the greater 350 ecosystem works. So again, we're all linked by, by branding, but we are none of us are legally obligated to uh, coordinate with each other, but it's, I'm so happy that we're having this meeting. So thank you so much to the 350 Milwaukee team for bringing us all together. Um, yeah, so I am here today as a representative from 350 Wisconsin. I do split my time between 350.org on the US team and then Wisconsin work. Um, as a couple of people have mentioned, we recently changed our name. You might have noticed as 350 Madison uh, before this. 
Um, I made some very hasty changes to the slide while people were talking. Uh, so we were founded in 2012. And then our change to 350 Wisconsin just a couple months ago uh, was just to reflect the fact that we are not doing work specific to Madison or Dane County because we're doing state policy work. Also through our pipeline work, we have been working up north and throughout the state, but I just want to make it very, very, very clear that we are not trying to take over 350 Milwaukee or 350 Stevens Point. Both of those chapters are still completely independent. This is not a, a hostile takeover. We're not trying to like step on toes. Uh, I think uh, John, our executive director, had conversations with people at both 350 Milwaukee. Um, Ju I think he talked to Julie there and then uh, some people at 350 Stevens Point. So just interested in how we can work with you all and um, you know support in whatever, whatever way we can. Um, so we are, um, I guess, somewhere kind of between 350 Chicago and Minnesota 350 in terms of our development. We are primarily volunteer led and run. Um, so we have a working board, which is of course entirely volunteers, and then a, a separate coordinating council, which is made up of uh, a representative from each of our core teams. So those are both volunteer led, uh, sort of they, they steer the overall direction of our organization. Uh, we do have five staff, and if it was helpful, I put a little timeline in here of the, the order in which that staff was hired on. So our Tar Sands Pipeline Organizer was our first staff member, and she is part-time. And then we had a development director, and then just within the last couple of years, we hired uh, the, our coordinator slash our volunteer coordinator slash business manager, and then communications, which is myself, and then our executive director last fall. And I should say that uh, except for the volunteer coordinator slash business manager, none of our staff people are full time. Um, just in case anybody from Milwaukee thinks they might be in the Madison area in the next month or two, uh, we are going to be tabling at Juneteenth uh, here in Madison. Um, so if you're on the like the west side of Milwaukee, like like I don't know, like Economa Walk or something, it's only a little over an hour to Madison, so it's not that bad. Uh, Monday, July 11th, we are having our annual picnic in place of our um, monthly meeting. Um, so yeah, again, if you happen to be in Madison, stop by and say hi. Uh, we are going to also be repeating our civil disobedience uh, flash mob that happened on Earth Day. We're repeating that on July 16th. Um, if anybody wants to watch a video of it, I highly recommend this, this little tiny URL here that'll take you to the YouTube video. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and then uh, later this, in July and August, we're doing fundraisers with the local sports teams, one with the soccer team, the Madison Forward Flamingos, and then the Madison Mallards. So if anybody wants to join us, more than welcome. Um, so we've got a number of major campaign teams. Uh, we have our climate justice team, and I'm just going to skip some of the text on here because I know we're running short on time. Uh, so that team is really working to create meaningful relationships and collaborate with groups that are outside of the traditional climate sphere throughout Wisconsin. So we want to be working with uh, BIPOC and frontline communities and, you know, various groups that might have more of a, a racial, social, economic justice focus as opposed to just strictly climate. Because 350 Wisconsin is primarily, primarily white membership. Um, so we wanted to try to be inclusive of people who might not have the time to volunteer for a climate organization. Um, you know, having time to volunteer is a major bar barrier to participation. Also, you know, we do do civil disobedience and for some people, civil disobedience feels a lot more unsafe than for other people. Um, you know, not all of us face the same threat from police that others do. So we also wanna be mindful of how can we um, encourage participation from people who might have different barriers than we, than we have. Uh, we also, the climate justice team has been doing a lot of focus on internal member education. So we've done a couple of book club clubs with uh, me and white supremacy. Uh, we also took a course uh, through the Nehemiah Center, which is a, an African-American organization here in Madison um, called Justified Anger. It was essentially a history of uh, African-Americans in the United States going back hundreds of years showing how that systemic racism is perpetuated in today's culture and society. So that's what our climate justice team has been working on. Our community climate solutions team is by far and away our largest team. They, their unofficial motto is think globally, act locally. So they work with communities and neighborhoods to achieve change on the small scale. Um, 
right now there are a bunch of different community working groups throughout the greater Madison area working on uh, building code reform, energy efficiency, renewable energy infrastructure, public transportation, electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, so those that team meets regularly with elected officials, uh, goes to a lot of city meetings, does a lot of interaction with, with public, public organizations. Uh, and then we recently, in the last couple of years, formed a state policy group. So again, this is part of our 350 Wisconsin rebranding. Uh, as a lot of us know, Wisconsin has some pretty weak climate policies compared to other Midwestern states, uh, especially with, uh, you know, as the most, most gerrymandered state in the country, our Wisconsin state legislature often does not reflect the same party that we have uh, in the executive branch. So poor Governor Evers can't get anything done because the legislature slaps it down. So the state policy group is really working on promoting strong progressive uh, statewide climate policies. Um, we have a pipeline resistance team. So this team has worked a lot with Minnesota 350 and other groups throughout the area. Uh, so really focusing on Enbridge's pipelines. So line 61 and line 66 in Wisconsin and Illinois, lines three and line five going through Minnesota, Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, yeah, so we've, we've spent a lot of time focusing on that. Of course, again, that is not local to Madison. So that was another reason why we uh, changed our name to, uh, to Wisconsin. And that team does a combination of uh, meeting with people within the halls of power. So working with uh, Department of Natural Resources or with legislative bodies, but also doing more in-person direct action or uh, grassroots mobilization. So um, this team really comes at activism and advocacy from both, both ends of the spectrum. Then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got our Divest into Fund team. So I think this is probably familiar to a lot of people in Milwaukee. Uh, we, like, like in Milwaukee, we are focused a lot on getting Chase Bank to divest from all fossil fuel related activities. So this is a campaign we've been part of for quite a long time now. And this is the, the team that is most active with civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action. We do plenty of you know, run of the mill protests outside of the bank, but we also do go in and sit down in the bank and refuse to leave and risk arrest and all that stuff. So Chase Bank is our primary target there. We also do some work on the University of Wisconsin, trying to get them to divest. Uh, other targets that are sort of a secondary focus, Wells Fargo, Liberty Mutual, State of Wisconsin Investment Board, and also the Federal Reserve, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, we that is our probably, uh, I guess, rowdiest team, you could say. Um, and we are also part of the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition, which I'm sure 350 Chicago and 350 Milwaukee are as well. I know Minnesota is as well. We also have an art collective team. We've got a lot of really talented artists uh, who are members. And this is a nice way if you're somebody who likes to do art, but you're not someone who wants to be on the front lines of activism, the way you could participate. So this started in 2020 as a get out the vote effort. Uh, so we've got, we had a lot of voting themed um, art projects going. And then it sort of transitioned into street theater. So here we have uh, two pictures from our Billionaires for Big Oil event where uh, we went in front of Chase Bank and uh, had a mock press conference about how we're billionaires and we are so happy that we are profiting off of cli the climate crisis. And then we also staged a mock wedding between Mr. J.P. Morgan Chase and Miss Silly Spilly Tarsans in her black plastic wedding gown, um, also outside of Chase. They love us there, really. Um, and then these are pictures from a uh, civil disobedience, which happened on Earth Day. So it was a dance flash mob that was everybody was either dressed in disco outfits or dressed like an animal or a tree or whatever. And they danced to Staying Alive, did a very 70s themed dance to Staying Alive. And then they did a die, a die in um, where they laid on the ground and they were dead for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then we had these delay equals death signs that, that came out. And then um, they then at the end they popped back up and started dancing to we will survive and so this is the event that's going to be repeated uh, again in front of chase bank in july and possibly in chicago in ask me again in 24 hours what the date is going to be well i don't know yet <laughs> um the next project that we're involved in is the Fossil Free Federal Reserve Campaign. So this is a joint project between 350 US, 350 Wisconsin, and 350 Colorado. Um, essentially what it is asking is that the Federal Reserve step in and make commercial banks stop investing in fossil fuel infrastructure. So it's looking like Chase is not gonna do what we're telling them to do. So we can make the Fed 
make them do it. You can think of the Fed as uh, America's um, economic referee that's supposed to safeguard the health of our economy and the stability of our financial system. And our argument is that the climate crisis is a threat to the stability of our economy, in addition to being a threat to all life on Earth. So this is uh, some of the demands that we have for the Federal Reserve. Um, so like I said, this is a, a three-way project. Um, coming up in August, a big group of, from Colorado are going to be going to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, every year, the Federal Reserve hosts a big uh, economic symposium for central bankers from around the world. And um, they're going to have a big protest outside of that symposium saying, hey, central banks, time to, time to do your job on climate. I also want to mention that just uh, just like within the last month or two, 350 Wisconsin launched our 501c4. So of course, before this, we were just a 501c3, which severely limited how much we could do um, in terms of political engagement and electoral work. But now we are super excited to get involved in um, being a little bit more explicit when we say, hey, don't vote for Ron Johnson. He's terrible. Like we couldn't say that before, but now we can. Um, as uh, those of you in Milwaukee know, Wisconsin is going to have one of, if not the most competitive U.S. Senate seats up for grabs this year. And then also our governor's race is going to be very, very, very tight. I read somewhere that Wisconsin is probably going to have the most out-of-state funding coming into our state for political advertising. So yay, you've all already noticed a big uptick in how many Ron Johnson ads you're seeing. Yeah, that's why. Um, so we're really wanting to keep the climate crisis central in the political conversation and really pushing for progressive candidates and policies that will address climate in ways that center racial, social, and economic justice. So I'm gonna skip over this a little bit. Uh, we're gonna be focused primarily this year on electoral organizing. So get out the vote and uh, messaging on candidates. I don't think we're going to be doing any primary endorsements um, for anybody who's following the US or the, the Wisconsin race for US Senate. I don't think we're gonna be endorsing in the, uh, the Democratic primary, but come the general, we will be. And then outside of election years, we would like to be more involved in policy work and lobbying. Um, again, as a 501c3, there was a limit to how much lobbying we could do, but with the C4, uh, some of those limitations go away. Uh, yeah, and here's my contact information. If anybody wants to reach out, it's a little confusing. Our email addresses are still 350madison.org. It's a very long saga. Don't ask me why, it's a very long story, but our website is 350wisconsin.org and all of our social media has been switched over as well. And I will uh, share a link to these slides in case uh, anybody wants to see more. I know I went really fast. And if you share it with me, we'll put it on our website eventually. Okay, that should be a link to the slides right there. Okay, I'll get that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Julie, would you like to uh, give a brief uh, discussion about uh, 350 Milwaukee, please? Okay. Julie, you're on mute. Julie, your microphone's off. That doesn't help, does it? No. Okay, here I go. 350 Milwaukee was founded uh, shortly after 350 Madison brought Bill McKibbins uh, to Madison uh, for uh, a talk. And we, uh, a bunch of us went over in cars. There was a busload of people that went from the um, Unita First Unitarian Church and afterwards, we gathered and said, well, we need to start our local chapter. So that, that probably was about 10 years ago. Um, I think it was, um, I think 350 Madison was very new at that point. And um, so we are structured very loosely. Uh, I say we're kind of loosey-goosey. We don't want to get bogged down in, into too many legalisms. And so we have, a, <clears throat> excuse me, we have um, no staff. It's all volunteers. And we also are, have not incorporated as a 501c3. Um, so there's no, and we don't have an office, we don't have any bills, we don't have any overhead. We just have uh, volunteers and our, our program work. So um, the, we do do a lot of coalition work and work with other environmental and um, social action groups in the community and have coordinated on regional levels also with um, 
Madison and Chicago. Um, for example, we took a couple bus loads down to the big uh, demonstration in Indiana at the oil refinery. I believe it may have been a Shell oil refinery, can't remember, but it was a, a real big regional event down there a few years back. And uh, I think the Chicago, there was a Chicago group that had organized it and a lot of uh, black activist groups in Chicago were involved in that uh, along the, the climate justice issue. Um, so we've been involved in some of those regional issues and also the line three and line five um, issues. Um, so basically um, over the years we've done you know, organizing of busloads to the big national rallies, had the three busloads going to New York City for the big climate rally and uh, two or three busloads going to Washington, D.C. Uh, we were involved in some of the behind the scenes organizing in the D.C. Um, a rally a few years back. And our, one of our, our steering committee people, George Martin, who couldn't be with us tonight, um, helped to organize the international uh, climate conference that was held that weekend in Washington, D.C. with uh, activists from other countries that came. And we tried to bring in a lot of uh, youth to those events in DC and uh, New York with um, working with the Youth Council of NAACP, getting almost have had about 15 um, young kids from the NAACP Youth Council. And um, we uh, fundraised for them and we fundraised to bring more Native American activists uh, on our bus loads to get to these national rallies also. So, so especially being a, you know, not, not an organized, uh, as, as organized a group with staff and all, we really do need to coordinate with other, um, uh, with other groups in the city and make the connections and work together. So right now the main actions that we're involved in um, are the Chase Bank campaign, which we've been doing for probably at least three years, if not more. Um, every Friday, we're down in front of the Chase Bank in downtown Milwaukee or else at one of the larger regional uh, branches. And we've um, not only picketed in front and leafleted, but we've uh, gone inside and had actions and there's been arrests and um, there have been um, so civil disobedience actions also. And right across the street from Chase just happens to be very conveniently the Wells Fargo main bank, Milwaukee. So we've done collaborative, coordinated uh, actions between with both those banks at once uh, on that corner, with the busiest corner in downtown Milwaukee. So the, since that is a national campaign, we've tried to communicate through letters and, and things with the national um, executives of Chase and Wells Fargo. And uh, that's been coordinated through the national uh, 350. And so that's really helpful. One thing we don't do, we feel we don't do enough is coordinate with national 350, but it was interesting for you to explain, Emily, that it was really, um, that there isn't, um, a lot of coordination between the local groups and the national, that it's a resource for us, but they don't lay out our action plans or, or they don't have a program that we have to follow, which is really good in a way because everyone has their own local issues that we want to, that you want to deal with. Um, for example, locally here, there's a number of our people from our 350 Milwaukee group that have been participating in the uh, Milwaukee County and City coordinated between both the county and the city, a task force on um, climate and, um, and economic justice. And this has been a two year project. Um, it's, they've just finished up this uh, spring and are uh, presenting their proposals to the city. And uh, a number of our, of our folks were very 
involved in, in the leadership of that. And um, so that's that's been a really good experience. And we hope that it has some impact. And we've gotten to know a lot of the people at the city level. And I think we have uh, some some you know good contacts to keep the pressure on so that something actually comes from this. It has to. Um, there's no choice at this point. There's um, there's also <clears throat> one of the things that we've been doing. Well, over the over the years, there's a few of us that have been making the links between militarism and climate change. A number of the people from 350 Milwaukee have come out of the peace movement and the anti-war movement, and um, there's several of us who are have had leadership in both organizations. And so we really are pretty committed at this point to, to work together, especially with Peace Action Wisconsin um, and the uh, Milwaukee um, Anti uh, and the Wars Coalition. Um, and so just recently, the and the Wars Coalition has started doing picketing in front of the offices of our con congressional delegates. Uh, to, uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin and uh, Gwen Moore, and then Ron Johnson is also on the list, um, and to uh, pick it in and give them <clears throat> letters of communication and meet with their staff about uh, reducing, drastically reducing military spending, which is just out of sight at this point, and putting a lot of that money into not only the you know, basic social needs programs that this country needs, but specifically into climate solutions. Um, and we've, um, our, our, tomorrow, this Friday, in fact, will be the first time that we've decided to uh, join um, a Friday picket uh, with the, with the um, anti, uh, the end of wars coalition. And this picket is being called a picket for peace and the planet. And um, we are going to be in front of Congresswoman Gwen Moore's office and the two demands that we're that we're going to be having are um, basically to re um, to reduce military spending and fund climate solutions, and to join the Democratic Party Council on Environment and Climate Crisis, and to be active with that council. So, um, as after we are after we spend an hour picketing in front of her office, we'll walk one block down the street to Chase Bank. And people from the End the Wars Coalition are going to be joining us at Chase Bank. So we'll be collaborating with even more people. But um, there's, I mean, I firmly believe that we can't win either of these battles so against uh, war and out of control military spending um, and the climate issues unless we collaborate and work together. There's a very strong link between militarism and climate change. And uh, we've been presenting a number of workshops and presentations and speeches uh, for a few years now on, the, on that connection. And um, George Martin and I have done workshops and uh, presentations on that at World Social Forums and other countries around the world and at uh, national democracy conferences and uh, the, um, the and, and local churches and uh, other peace organizations in other cities around. And so we really are trying to um, encourage people to make these links that we need one another in order to make a difference. So. Okay, sounds. Uh, that it. Sounds good. Thank you, Julie, for, for filling us in on 350 Milwaukee. Um, I see there's a lot of uh, traffic in the chat and some of them are questions. Okay, Michael. Yeah, I was just curious if other 350 groups have been working on the issue of connecting militarism and climate change. Emily? Yeah, I just put a link in the chat. Uh, just in February, 350 Wisconsin, our monthly meeting speaker was uh, a group talking about the link between um, military activity and the climate crisis. And locally here in Madison, we've been really involved in, in the fight against the F-35s that are stationed here at the Madison airport, which is, you know, a 
both, you know, it's a multifaceted issue with the, the, the neighborhoods that are most impacted by the noise and the air pollution from these jets are the lower income BIPOC communities. And then of course, these jets spew God knows how much carbon in the air and like, plus like, do we really need them? No, like, yeah. Uh, so those are issues that was that 350 Wisconsin has been super um, interested in. And um, I forgot to mention in my, in my bit that uh, all of our meetings are, our monthly meetings are Zoom. So I uh, would certainly welcome any and all of you at them there. Generally the first Monday of the month, obviously July, that's the fourth. So we're not having that, but generally the first Monday of the month. <clears throat> Melissa. Yeah, so T and Emily, it really struck me when you were both talking like the number of various and varied campaigns that you have. And I was just curious, like um, how those are structured in terms of leadership. So is there like a paid staff person on each of those campaigns or is it like volunteers could be leading those and, and do volunteers lead more than one or is it kind of like people stick to a, a campaign? Um, for MN350, um, the leader of all of our programs are led by staff, and then staff develop and train their volunteers to take in different roles. For example, our food systems, there's four or five different programs that one staff person is leading. So she has um, to train some volunteers to take some of the work that she's leading so that she can, you know, be able to um, be able to manage all of those programs. But we have a, a large volunteer base, but our leaders are from the staff because we have some grants. And then some of our grants are in general ops. And most of our grants support the work that we are doing. So then we have to submit a narrative of the work that we've done with their money. Not all grants ask for that, but a lot of them do in our budget report. Yeah, and in, here in Wisconsin, uh, for 350 Wisconsin, the answer to your question is it kind of varies. Um, so like uh, our, um, our tar, tar sands pipeline team, that one is led by a, a staff member. Um, and that's because our tar sands team is actually uh, a coalition team between us and Sierra Club, uh, the Wisconsin Sierra Club chapter. So they do have, so Sierra Club has a staffer on it. And then we have our part-time organizer and she was the first staff member hired on for that campaign. Um, community climate solutions and state policy are 100% volunteer led. The volunteers decide what direction they want to go, which, which projects they want to pursue, how they want to structure themselves. They are supported by paid interns. Um, so every semester they have at least one or two interns. Each intern I think gives uh, is between five and 10 hours a week. So they do have intern support. Um, the uh, divest and defund team is almost entirely volunteer run and led. A little tiny sliver of my time is for that team, but it is primarily volunteers. And then we've got uh, our, our fundraising team, of course, is led by our development director, but that is also a lot of volunteer work. And um, our communications team is my, my own time as a staffer and then a bunch of volunteers. So. Um, I guess an answer to your question, it just really depends on the campaign. And there are lots and lots of people who have pre a presence on multiple, multiple campaigns. And it's it's really the volunteers that decide if we're gonna be taking on a new campaign or not. If I could just follow up with each of you, roughly how many people, how many volunteers who are solid volunteers, I guess I'd call them, do you each, have in your organization and uh, volunteering for those teams? Uh, for us, I guess it depends on how you define solid. I guess uh, taking an active leadership role in shaping our campaigns and the overall direction of the organization as a whole, a couple dozen maybe, um volunteers who show up for at least two events a year maybe more like a hundred uh like i mean like any volunteer run organization we've got the people who are giving 20 hours of their time a week and then we've got the people who show up once a year so uh 
Yeah, and I was going to say um, our staff lead all of our work. And as I was saying earlier, we're trying to shift our focus to be organizational led, community led, and then um, volunteer engaged. But I would say actively, we have over a thousand volunteers. But in our database, we have over 15,000 volunteers in our database. So we have a large volunteer base. One of the things that we recognize is that um, of our great volunteers, which I think is amazing um, that we have that uh, amount of volunteers, we also noticed that we have not very many BIPOC volunteers. And so that's one of the things that we're working towards is to add in more BIPOC communities to help lead um, some, not lead, but support the work that we're doing. And so, you know, one of the things that the staff just talked about is that their volunteer engagement goes up and down like a roller coaster. And part of the discussion that we had is what roles are you putting the volunteers in? How much do you engage? And some people are zoomed out. And so it's nice. And so trying to get outside and put volunteers in roles that they feel like I'm using my time, I wanna be utilized and not just be in the background. So really trying to do surveys now to find out what role our volunteers wanna play in the work that we're doing. Um, it's nice to have a lot of people leading, but then we also need some people just to show up and do some other um, hands-on work. So we are now doing some surveys on trying to find out what our volunteers are doing in our pipeline. We have very active volunteers, and then they had a period of just stagnate, stagnation that they didn't have too much going on after the line three, and now things are picking up again. And so they get bored in one program. The nice thing about MN350, they can go to another program. I just talked to two volunteers who came into the office and said they was in one program and now they want to get more involved. And so they are doing, and they want to talk to elected officials. So they shift their work to a different campaign. And so just because they're in one don't mean that it's just my own volunteer. We let them know any of the opportunities within MN350 that they can be engaged in. So we're, we're pretty fortunate that we have a large volunteer base, but I do think it's important to keep them engaged. Yeah, and just to really quickly follow up on, on T's point, I see a bunch of people with their hands up. Um, having us, us having a volunteer coordinator makes a huge difference because she is able to, when a new volunteer signs up, she is able to follow up with them and find out exactly what their interests are. Do they prefer to be behind the scenes? in the in the front of the action how many hours a week do they give you know what are they are there certain professional skills of their own they would like to develop so having the volunteer coordinator i think makes a a huge difference but you know we also recognize that part of a big thing with volunteer burnout is if you bring in a volunteer and all of a sudden they feel like they're like in charge of a whole section of the organization that's going to make somebody burn out pretty quick so um we want to continue being a volunteer driven organization, but also balance that with having the staff support there to um, prevent decision fatigue or um, for people feeling like they've been overburdened with responsibility that they weren't wanting, so. Thank you both. That's very informative, mm -hmm. very informative. Charlie. <clears throat> yeah, this is a question for, for T. Um, I guess um, line three is operable now, right? They're actually shipping oil through it. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about how people judge that action. Are people discouraged? Is that considered kind of a failure of action or what? How do you, how do you go forward with that now? What's next around the, uh, the pipelines? Yes, of course, many people feel like it's a failure. I mean, we are still dealing with some legal issues um, from people who protest um, fighting for water. And so we're now sending letters to the governor to stop the felony charges, drop those charges. And so there's still a lot of follow-up that we are still working on from line three. And so, yeah, there's a disappointment, but now it's, it's, we're at a place on what's next and what lessons that we learned from line three as we're now engaged with line five pipeline. And so um, there is a, a sense of, boy, you know, we didn't win that and still hurt. I would say that when I'm talking to our indigenous community, the, the nice thing at MN350, we have three uh, indigenous staff um, who's there and, and um, Andy, who's also uh, as an ally, a white ally for the indigenous community, let that work as well. And so when you talk about pipeline, I wasn't there, but I knew about the pipeline because I'm from Minnesota and it was all over the news. But just talking to them about that, you can still hear that hurt, you know, come out of them. And so it's still there. I mean, how do you how do you generate hope 
for future actions when that enormous effort apparently didn't seem to stop the pipeline? Well, part of it is our political allies. You know, some people felt like they didn't get the legal, the political support that they needed to stop the pipeline. Um, I think there was some discussion about the decisions of the governor, the decisions of some of our other elected officials. And so that still lays heavy um, with uh, that community, our community. And so one of the things that we're talking about is now we have this line five, what's, what, what's next? I don't think that it creates a sense of hopelessness. I think that it creates a sense of opportunity of lessons learned. And okay. what else can we do uh, with line five and other work that we can align ourselves with? So I, I don't feel like there's a sense of now we've lost and we're defeated, but there's still more energy from this group about lessons learned and other opportunities and things that they can learn from that. I know that the legal cost of the pipeline is what we're trying to work to, um, towards. And if we can win, you know, some of those felonies that people are still dealing with and the misdemeanors that they're faced from that action that took place in the pipeline, I think that would feel like a win from, from that community. Okay, thank you. And I just wanna add something really quickly. I know that like, we're also trying to frame line three as just a way to learn about how we can then succeed on line five. And I know that a lot of effort on line five has been focused on the, the reroute around the, the Bad River Band Reservation in Northern Wisconsin, because if we can just get that one reroute shut down, canceled, then we can make it prohibitively expensive for Enbridge to build this pipeline along a different route. And so if we can get just one crucial segment of these pipelines shut down, you know, line three connects to line five. So if we get right. line five shut down, where's line three gonna go? Um, right. So just more all, Okay. I would also say real quick that we also are trying to figure out other lessons learned from our labor. You know, we had division on line three where you have some labor organizations that wanted line three because mm. it created jobs. And then you had other labor organizations who was on, you know, allyship with us on that. So trying to find out because my background, I, I don't know if many of you know, but I worked in labor for a long time and trying to figure out if we're dealing with line five, what are some lessons? And is it about jobs or health of the, our community and taking land from our indigenous groups? So just trying to learn those lessons as well. Okay, great. Larry. So my, my question is going back to that volunteer engagement issue. You know, we've, Melissa said we have about 20 sort of people who do regular work for us. You know, before the pandemic, it was probably up to like 35 and we had people just burn out and like you said, get zoomed out. Um, and I guess that's one of the things that probably the, the volunteer engagement, you know, having a volunteer coordinator, um, We've had people who do, who've done outreach um, in the past, but I guess the, the question I have is like, what are the strategies that, that you use in order to keep people from A, burning out? I know you mentioned something earlier about uh, not allow, giving them a sort of a lot of responsibility right at the beginning, but I guess, how do you keep people engaged? So they, you know, they come in and then, uh, how do you plug them in? So that's one of the problems. I think one of the struggles we've had is just getting people engaged and then getting them to uh, plug them in, figure out where they where they fit, and then um, having them stick around. I guess that's one of the things that we've struggled with. Yeah, I mean, I before I came to North Point, I was a manager. One of my staff was a volunteer coordinator um, that we had, and we had you know large programs that we ran, and I think having um, almost like a job description of what it is, the work that you want the volunteers to do is important so they know the timeline of, of the event. When do you need them, what time? And then if they know every Tuesday, this is what I'm doing, but when they show up, you gotta let them do the work because sometimes volunteers show up, they're inactive or they're not utilized or they're overutilized, you know? So sometimes, I mean, you got both ends of it but if I know, because I, I volunteer, even outside of my work at MN350, I wanna know when I'm showing up, this is what I'm committing to do. Um, here's my task. I feel comfortable, I feel knowledgeable. Who's my go-to person that I can go to when I'm at this event in case I have questions or there's a problem that arises that I'm there, who can I go to to help troubleshoot? So they gotta have all those pieces in place. And then is there another opportunity? 
yes or no. And if I don't want to do that, then maybe I want to do something different. So creating those pathways for volunteers. But I think it's important that they know exactly um, what it is that they're going to do when they show up. And then ask them afterwards, how did it go? You know, what is something that we can learn from? And they love to give that feedback. It went well or it didn't go well. And here's what I think I needed more support from. Yeah, I would say like, for us, definitely um, focusing on if it's a new volunteer, giving them um, a discrete, time limited task where there is a, a firm end goal, not just sort of some nebulous like, oh, you'll your volunteer work will be done when line five is shut down. That's that's not helpful. Like that's that's overwhelming. It's a lot to put on someone. Um, so like if they show up to an event, like you know we need someone to stuff these envelopes or whatever, something just like you know distinctly like this is the task, and then as they become interested, I. I'm not a big fan of the phrase later ladder of engagement because it implies a hierarchy to me, but um, it's, it is a good analogy, I guess. Uh, but, you know, so like they've done that first step, what's the next step? Um, and then, you know, the people who want to be involved in the, the more um, hands-on volunteer roles, like being on the board of directors and like, you know, helping us with our strategic planning, they will, you know, eventually get deeper and deeper into the organization and um, find their, find their place. But, you know, or organizations like ours, we need the people who are willing to just do the, the envelope stuffing or stand at a table and hand out flyers. We need those people. And um, yeah, just making sure they don't feel super overwhelmed from the get-go is I think I think huge. So you're basically saying start with a small task, start them with smaller tasks and then see how, see how they wish to work up, work their way in further. Yeah, unless somebody comes in and is like, I really, really have this like grand vision for how to structure a new campaign team, then in that case, you know, use your judgment. But the vast majority of volunteers are not going to be like that. And um, if it's helpful for uh, for the Chicago and Milwaukee crews, I can put you in touch with our volunteer coordinator and you could like pick her brain. That'd be great. Yeah, and I was going to say, we also have a volunteer team that's our fundraising team. And they are, they specifically said, this is what I want to do. I think it's very important to ask volunteers what it is. Here's, here's the work that we have. And then they can say, this is what I want to do. Um, because for me, I don't want to go and stuff envelopes. I feel like I want to do something else when I'm volunteering. So it's, it's different from each person. And you have to lay out what, what it is, what work you need done. I'm meeting with the volunteer, our fundraising team on Thursday. One of them is, um, is a teacher and she loves writing. And so she said, hey, I noticed on your website, you have some grants. I would love to help you write some grants. And so I'm just gonna meet with her to try to pick her ear, find out what that means, what her background is. But I mean, that's all volunteer base is our fundraising team. Oh, great. Um, Alex. So here, here in Chicago, we just had um, a new uh, Chicago Climate Action Plan released in the last couple of months. And so um, we're hoping to um, start meeting with aldermen and working with other environmental organizations in Chicago to uh, make sure this plan is implemented. And um, I'm just wondering what, um, what other, other groups have done um, about local climate policy, climate policy at the city level, um, what sorts of policies you all have focused on and also what sorts of uh, political strategies you employed uh, trying to make you know, climate action happen um, at the local city level? I've been talking a lot, so I'd like some of the other, uh, other partners to weigh in. Linda, would you uh, like to say something about that? All right, so I, I heard that you were asking about local climate action, right? And, yeah. okay, and, and my impression was that Chicago was well ahead of Milwaukee on local climate action and has been doing, uh, you know, progress reports on, uh, on the climate action. And so in, in Milwaukee, as, as you might have seen, um, we, and, and as uh, Julie was making reference to, uh, we have a task force um, and that has submitted a proposal and now 
it's in the hands of uh, a consulting um, firm uh, that will be taking our proposals from nine or 10 different working groups on, on the various topics and uh, putting that all together into a draft plan um, that I expect will be coming out probably in the fall and then presented to the city's common council and to the county's board of supervisors. Um, so uh, the, the experience with the working groups was, was really good because um, we recruited, uh, you know, numerous people um, throughout the community to join the task force members on these working groups, you know, one being on what, what we called green buildings, um, one being on transportation. Um, I was heading up uh, a working group on what we called nature in the city that uh, dealt with um, the planting of, of trees, shrubs, and perennials, you know, and, and uh, removing concrete and asphalt. So um, do, did you have a more specific question uh, about our, our local action? No, I was just wondering, you know, what sorts of policies you're, you're most, most interested in pressing for. And also, if, I mean, we're trying to work with other environmental organizations as part of like a, a coalition to lobby aldermen. So I was just interested in learning what, you know, what strategies have, have worked in your area. Oh, okay. Well, what, what comes to mind on the policy front um, is uh, we're concerning commercial buildings, you know, which is anything from office buildings to multifamily apartment buildings. Um, and, um, you know, the, the effort there is to get an up-to-date building code um, and to get uh, benchmarking so that uh, energy use in these buildings can be tracked you know, and then lead up to uh, performance standards for the energy use in those buildings. And so uh, there's a bit of a go slow approach that is being taken with that so that um, our group has an opportunity to meet with, um, with these commercial building owners and um, you know, explain uh, what the objective is and, and how we could get there and uh, probably recruit some leaders within that community to, uh, to speak in favor of it. And um, so, uh, you know, that, that's what's happening on that front. The rest of our proposal, I, I, I would have to say, is more project-based rather than policy-based. I think there was also an effort to uh, quantify CO2 emissions in the city. There was a major effort um, put into that to find out where are the major emissions and to address those in particular. And there's also a major social justice component to it as well. That's right. Uh, economic development as well. Yes, uh, we, uh, so the greenhouse gas inventory was done, which you've had in Chicago as well. Um, but this was the first time that we did have one for the city of Milwaukee and then one was done for the county of Milwaukee as well. Um, so we see that, uh, that commercial buildings, residential buildings, um, are the lead sources of our, you know, urban area emissions, followed by transportation, you know, and of course our utility is, is a big factor in how they're generating electricity. Um, so we see where the emissions are coming from and where we have to bring them down. Um, and, and then as Charles was saying about the equity component, um, 
We have a, a green jobs accelerator um, that is part of the proposal. So that, um, you know, so that's one of the components of equity is uh, being careful that the jobs generated by this transition to a greener economy in Milwaukee um, is providing benefits to uh, our communities where they are most needed and that these being be living wage jobs that we are defining as um, as providing in um, you know pay pay of forty thousand a year and up. Emily, I just want to make sure people were were done uh, asking Linda questions. I uh, I was gonna ask a different question. So no, okay. Um, <clears throat> So as I alluded to earlier, um, a, a group of us are planning a big action in Chicago, uh, and it would be a multi-target action. So Chicago has one of the biggest Chase Bank uh, offices in downtown Chicago. There's a Federal Reserve. And then there's also uh, BP's, correct me if I'm wrong here, Larry, head of North American Pipelines Operations, something like that. Yeah, and basically, yeah, basically the, the BP location, the head, the regional headquarters is at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they do run their pipeline operations out of there. Um, and a lot of it funnels down to their Whiting uh, plant, Whiting, Indiana, where that big protest was several years ago. Um, so it'd be the Federal Reserve, Chase Bank, and then BP at those sort of three uh, in one day. Yeah, so a really attractive trio of targets uh, that we're all familiar with to varying degrees. Um, and we would like to have at least one bus coming from Wisconsin going down to Chicago. We're talking about Fridays, because I know that the, the Milwaukee crew does a lot of actions on Fridays. And so maybe your volunteers are particularly free that day. But uh, ideally, this bus will be going from Madison to Milwaukee down to Chicago, details are still being figured out, but um, I'm gonna put some dates in the chat. And if you feel really strongly about one of these dates, please uh, let me know because we're just tomorrow going to be nailing down a specific uh, date for this. So if it's uh, if th that sounds like something you would like to participate in, uh, please uh, let me know. Great. Okay, well, we, um, we are out of time. Um, unfortunately, because I could sit here and listen for another hour. Um, let me know through mail if you think this was um, beneficial and if you'd like to do it again. I know we covered a lot of territory, a lot of different ideas, which I found very interesting because it gave me a lot of background on, on things that that uh, strategies that people are using in order to um, uh, to make their organizations effective. And uh, so there's a lot of useful information here, which a lot of which could be delved in uh, much, much more deeply. But uh, we are out of time. So I wanna thank everybody uh, who joined us tonight uh, for joining us and um, this will be available within probably 10 days. I'll have this up on our website. Uh, I know that I'm gonna go through it and make a lot of notes on what was said, but it'll be available to, uh, to view again, as well as I'll put the uh, chat up there and, uh, and Emily's slides. So, so some of these things will be available to, uh, for, for further review and uh, for further mining. Um, so I especially want to thank, and I think Melissa has had to sign off, uh, but uh, thank T and Emily and Larry, especially for, uh, for joining us and talking about this and everybody else from uh, outside of 350 Milwaukee, as well as the 350 Milwaukee uh, members for engaging in this. So thanks and we'll 
try and keep this uh, more or less on schedule and respect people's uh, time. So thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. A lot of great information. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, thanks for sharing. Good night, all. Good night. Bye.